follows you all day long. And uh, what we're going to look at this, this morning is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, starting with verse 2. We're going to talk about Paul's joys and keeping an attitude of gratitude. In life, we look at the world around us, and uh, sometimes there's so much going on, it's hard to keep the proper perspective. It's hard to keep a positive view on, on what's happening in our lives. And uh, it, it don't matter which political party you're in, if you watch any of the news channels, eventually you're going to get discouraged because it's just negative all the time and all the possibilities of war going on. And, and, and I don't know about you, I watch some of that stuff, but times I just turn it off because you know what there's nothing I can do to change it all I can change and all anything that I can affect is is how I respond to things and so then when you go from a, a worldly view and a national view to a local situation things that are going on in our own towns uh, people in our own communities uh, I don't know about you but it seemed like the gossip gossip chain or the Facebook chain or the Twitter or whatever account you have uh, you can know any dirt going on about anybody. And after I pastor somewhere for a while, sometimes people begin to get nice to me because they know that I know all the dirt on them. <laughs> it's not because I go looking for it. It's because people come and tell me, do you, do you know the story about so-and-so? And it never seems to fail. Most times when I go into a church, that I go into a church that's either divided that's on the verge of division, and there's never seems to be an attitude of gratitude in the church because it's this side against that side, and this side wants what they want, and this side wants what they want. And I can go into a church and never ask a question and be told all the stuff that people want me to hear. And, and I sat back and I listened to it, and I, I take about this much stock in it, because I know how it is. When someone attacks me, what do I do? I get my fur up. And uh, I think, well, what dirt do I know about them? Hmm, how can I put this in a preaching scriptural way to make it sound like I'm sharing truth, but I'm really going after them? You know how that is? And who can I get, you know, you know how, anyway, who's going to get a whooping today? And, and so, but Paul went through a lot of this stuff in the church of Corinth, in 1 Corinthians, we, we realize that Paul wrote the first letter and the church was having problems and the church of Corinth was having problems. And, and what I have done in my ministry, probably for the last 20 years, I have studied churches and why churches do not grow. And actually, I've written a book, uh, One of Church Sins, dealing with the seven churches of Revelations. And on the, on the second book I'm wanting to, to finish, it's called Whose Church Is It? And it deals with the church of Corinth. Because the church of Corinth had a lot of problems. They were divided. They followed different people. But they never followed God. They followed who they thought was best. And one of the churches that I did interim pastor work was Corinth Baptist Church in Cassville, Missouri. And, and they were having some problems. They had uh, some division among them. And, and uh, we were talking. And they said, well, what do you think we need to do to fix a problem? I said, well, first of all, you need to change the name of the church. Because when I read 1 Corinthians, all, they, all I get from Corinth Baptist Church is church is totally messed up. All they do is fight. And they bicker. And he said, hmm, sounds familiar. But... What has to take place is, in order for a church and a body of believers to be able to do what God wants them to do, is we have to change our attitude that it's no longer about what I desire, about what I want, it's about what God wants. It's about gratitude. There are two men walking in the field one time, and, and I can relate to this, and because uh, during the time with Janelle and I was at SBU, I took care of a, about a 500-acre farm with 150 head of cattle uh, for Gerald Andrews. And uh, so one day Gerald and I was out, and, and I can relate this day, and we had a big old bull, we had a big old Hereford bull, and he probably weighed right about 2,500 pounds. And we had put him in a pen about the size of this, and we had shut the gate it was a big old one, two by 12 oak gate. I mean, it was solid as a rock. And we shut the gate, and about that time, I heard boom, 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 boom. And Gerald and I looked back, and we hugged the barbed wire fence because that bull came through that fence, shattered it. And we both were very much praying men at the time. 
He grazed us. Now, there are times, though, when I would work the calves when they were first born, that I would get out and what we would do, we would, we would uh, clip their ears, put a tag in them, and if they were a, a male cow, we would ban them, and, uh, so, which is not a good image for us guys, but we would ban them to make them steers. And there were a time or two when the mama did not like me sitting on top of her calf. And so now I had learned enough working with cows and, and delivering cows and stuff that I knew that if the cows started to charge me, if I would wait till they got within so many feet, step to the side, because once they drop their head, you can usually get away from them. And I always had a big old stick with me. And one time this mama cow, I was trying to work her calf and she huffing and puffing and snorting and stomping and here she came and I watched her and I stood up and I stepped to the side and I went BAM and hit her in the head and she shook her head trying to get her to leave me alone well that just made her mad <laughs> she reared back up and she came at me again and the second time I waited and stepped back and, and popped her again with that big old stick and then she left me alone so I worked the calf and, and I guarantee you I had the gratitude of attitude because I knew what to do how to work with cows and not get run over and, and so and that's the thing there were two guys in the field one time and a big old bull was coming after them and they evidently weren't men of faith because they were running and the bull was catching them and one yelled at the other say a prayer and that one says, I don't know a prayer. He said, well, say something. He said, I don't either. And he said, well, the only thing I know is to pray what daddy prayed at the supper table. Lord, make us thankful for what we're about to receive. <laughs> uh, trust me, I have been there. Now, cows are not too hard to deal with. Bulls, man, I tell you what, they can stop and turn on you in a heartbeat and put a whooping on you, you know, like no, no problem. And so Paul was writing to this church in Corinth, and this is his second letter to them. And, and, and he was trying to help them to understand and, and that, uh, well, he had a lot of joy in what God was doing with them. So look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, starting with verse 2. And let's stand this morning in honor of God as we read his word. Paul starts out, he says, make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have exploited no one. I do not say this to condemn you. I have said before you that I have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die with you. I have great confidence in you. I take great pride in you. I am greatly encouraged in all the troubles my joy knows no bounds. For when we came into Macedonia, the body of ours had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn, conflicts out on the, on the outside, fears within. But God, but God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also his comfort by had given him, you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. Let's pray. Father, we come to this morning, and we thank you for this wonderful day to be in your house, and we thank you for how you've taken care of us in so many ways. Father, it's so easy to not have to have an attitude of gratitude. It's so easy not to have any joy in being your child. But Father, I pray that you help us from this point on to realize that there is always joy no matter what we're going through because it brings glory and honor to you. Father, I thank you for what you've done. I praise you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Now Paul started out by telling them that he was writing to that he had, heart, he had, he had room in his heart for them. Now, you've got to remember that Paul was not always welcome to the church of Corinth. As a matter of fact, Paul had shared with them many things. But if you go back, and one of the reasons why Paul wrote this letter was in order to help them. to Well, there were some that just didn't like Paul. Have you ever met somebody you just didn't like when you walked up and seen them? <laughs> Have you ever seen somebody you walked in or they walked into your house and you look at them and you think, you know, you just need to be smacked. I don't know you, but you have that look like someone just needs to pop you. I, there's times I could probably use an attorney, trust me. I do control my emotions. 
But there are just some that you walk into a room and they walk in up to you and they have that look. They just, you know, they just need to be hit. But now here's, you got to understand when Paul wrote his first letter to the church of Corinth, they were a church that was divided. If you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and we look at verse 1 through 4 and we see what was going on here, Paul writes about the division in the church. He says, brothers, I could, I, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly, since there is jealousy and quarreling among you. You're not worldly. Uh, you, you are not worldly. You're not acting like, you, you are not acting like mere men. For men once said, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Paulus. You are you not mere men. What was going on in the church of Corinth at the time when, when Paul wrote his first letter is there was division among the church because the people had chosen who they were going to follow and who were not going to follow. I like this preacher better than that preacher. I like this Sunday school teacher better than that Sunday school teacher. And what was going on is Paul had done what God had called him to do about helping start the church and to grow the church. And, and Paul knew his job very well at what God had called him to do. And it was to go and to, to tell and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. But, but Paul realized that he moved in his, his responsibility. God had called him to be a missionary. And so Paul knew that as he left and what the word was getting back to Paul was, was there were people picking sides saying, well, I like the way Paul does it, and, and, or I like the way Apollos does it because I like their preaching style or their teaching style. I like how they do this, and I like how they do that. And, and, and because people liked what they wanted and liked what they were doing is they were, well, they were talking bad about the ones they don't like. Can you relate to that? People just like to, to pick on people. And Paul said, now wait a minute here. I'm not causing you division. I'm not causing you heartache. I, I didn't do anything. All I did was share with you the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul was saying, hey, I have love in my heart for all of you. I can't control what you say. I can't control what you think. All I can control is what I do. Now, I've been in the ministry some 30 plus years, and, and I guarantee you, every church I pastored, they just filed down and they worshiped me, and I was just, no one ever talked bad about me. Man, I'm a lying fool, aren't I? <laughs> Often advise young men going into ministry, and I tell them, the first one that will be your best friend will be the first one that will stab you in the back. And they will take that knife, and they will twist it, and they will dig it in you. When I had my stroke, I had pastored at Sir Cox in Missouri, and when I was there, I, uh, I had someone who wanted to be my friend, and he, he tried to, to buy me gifts, and he did everything he could to be my friend, and so I allowed him into my, my circle. And there's one thing as a pastor you do not do, you do not have best friends. I'm sorry. If I was to be a pastor of this church here, I'd say, I'm friends with all of you, but chances are, if any of you know my deepest thoughts, any of you being my best friend, it's not going to happen because of experience, because of being hurt. Matter of fact, I had a, a Janelle worked for this guy who claimed to be my best friend at Sir Coxie, and when I had had my stroke, guess what? Things changed. He was, I was no longer useful to him. So the Sunday I resigned from the church because I could no longer speak, I could no longer pastor, I could no longer deal with stress, I, I was just, I was done. The Sunday I resigned from church, he fired Janelle on Monday. So we went from having her income and the insurance for both of us to having no insurance and no income at all. Wow. Wanted to be my best friend. He told Janelle, I lost my best friend. She said, you didn't lose your best friend. He's still the same guy. He just, had a, he just has health issues. I become useless to him. You often wonder why pastors sometimes are very leery and very standoffish, and that's why. But Paul was saying here is very simply this. He says, I have, even though you have talked bad about me, even though you have said things about me, even though you think things bad about me, I, I don't care. Because he says in verse 2, make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have exploited no one. 
And he goes on here in verse 3, I do not say this to condemn you. I have said before that you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die with you. Paul says, my love for you, it doesn't matter what you have said about me. And no matter what you have done to me, I don't hold a grudge because he knew what it was all about. Sometimes we hold grudges because of me. Me, myself, and I. But if we were really like Jesus, what would we do? We would view people as Jesus viewed them. We all make mistakes. We all mess up. We're all to forgive because we have been forgiven. No one on this earth can do anything to hurt you more than we hurt Jesus on the cross. And the only one that gets hurt because we do not forgive, because we do not love, is ourselves. If you don't like what I say today, that's okay. You can tell me not to come back next week. That won't hurt my feelings at all. I got the check already today. I'm in good shape. <laughs> well, Janelle's got it. That's all right. You pay me to be not nice to you for as an interim. As I shared with someone earlier, what you heard last week is what I, this is how I preach. This is how I've always preached. I don't dog around. I don't water it down. I tell you what the Bible tells me. I tell you what God shares with me to tell you. I don't know your past. I don't know your history to speak of. I really don't care if God's stepping on your toes or not. It's not me. It's the Holy Spirit saying, you need to get right with me. See, I'm not the one convicting you. It's God's the ones that are convicting you. He knows your heart. He knows your attitude. And Paul says, because I have such a love for you, we have joy. Verse 4, I have confidence in you. I take pride in you. I am greatly encouraged in all our trouble. May joy knows our, my joy knows no bound. Paul says, I have pride in you. We can have pride in others. We don't need to have pride in ourselves. But we can have pride in others. We can take pride in doing a good job. But after a while, people get tired of hearing you talk about how great you are, don't they? It's got that old Mac Davis song, Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the metal. I get better looking each day. Some say that I'm egotistical. I didn't even know what that means. It must be the way that I feel at my, you know, all the rest of it. <laughs> but Paul says, I have pride that you have went from, from being a church that was divided because you liked who you liked to being a church that's focused on doing God's will. Paul says, I have no problem. Having joy, making room for others in our heart all comes down to attitude. Paul reminds all of us the hardships that he endured. And, and, and as a child of God and a serving God, it's not always going to be easy. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5 says, For when we came into Macedonia, this body of ours had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn. Conflicts on the outside, fears within. Paul says, you know, as we serve God at Macedonia... He, he's, not, he's not talking to the church of Corinth now. He says, even though we're here at Macedonia doing God's work, he said, we're being harassed on the outside and we fear on the inside. If you don't fear, if you say, I, I don't fear nothing, we, you, you're a lying dog. We all fear something. And Paul says, we, we fear this, we're being harassed, and, and, and we're not risked, and we're wore out, we're beaten down. And, and it's just like the church that, that we are at Iberia, Missouri, we were forced terminated. We, we'd seen 130-some-plus people come to know Jesus Christ in the three and a half years we were there, and the deacons decided they, they, they just didn't like me. They went through 25 pastors in 20 years. That was the church I talked to about last week. But you know what? Here's the thing we have to realize is, is you know, we sometimes have a, we have a fear. But we have to get to the point where we realize it's not about what man can do to us. It's what God can do to us. Verse 7, 6 through 7 says, here's what happens. He said, but even though we went through all these conflicts, even though we went through all this hardship, and, and we had all this fear within... Paul says in verse 6, But God who comforts the downcast, comforted us by, coming, by the coming of Titus. 
and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, and, and, and that my joy was greater than ever. When we say focus upon what is going on around us, we, we get down and we need to remember that no matter what is going on in the world, God is the one that can comfort it and help us through this difficult time. I, I wish I could say without a doubt that, that my ministry has been a joy all the time. But, you know, after two heart attacks, a stroke, it's not been easy. Why? Because I, 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 I hurt when you hurt. See, so here's the thing as a pastor, when you have a hire a pastor, you, you need to understand a few things about the pastor you hire. When you are a pastor of a church, that becomes your family. And when you bury one of your friends, okay, you know how it is to lose a loved one, how hard it hurts? A pastor never gets to rest because as soon as you put into ground one of your friends, they may not be your best friend. They may never know that you cared for them like you want them to care. But you bury someone that's your friend and someone you loved and cared for. Then the very next hour or the very next day, they're sitting in a hospital with another couple, another family whose who's fast spouse is maybe having open heart surgery or dying of cancer. There's been a number of times in my ministry where, where family members would come up to me and say, well, mom and dad, they're just hanging on because we think they're hanging on because of us. Would you go tell them it's okay to die because we'll be okay? And I'd walk into the, to the hospital room and, and I'd sit with them and I'd say, hey, John, how's things going? Man, I, I want to let you know your family's going to be okay. And they, they, they know that you're trying to hang on for them, but they're going to be all right. And I tell you what, John, I'll be here to take care of them. And more times than not, within 10 or 15 minutes, holding their hand, they died. And I'd walk out and I'd say, oh, they're gone. He, he, he squeezed my hand saying, it's okay. He, he knows where he's at. See, that's the thing as a pastor. When you hire a pastor, you, you, you often don't like him or don't agree with what he's doing because of what you want and what you think is right, that you don't realize all the heartache and the hurt and, and how they, they hurt when you hurt. Who you go to when things are going rough? When your children don't act like they should, when your grandchildren disappoint you, or when your spouse or your business partner or someone, who do you go to? Who do you share all your deep, dark hurts with? You share them with your pastor, and he wants you to because he wants to, to hurt with you and he wants to laugh with you. See, here's the thing we got to remember. He realizes what we need to realize is, is that our comfort comes from God. And, and just as Paul says we are thankful for, for, for Titus coming to us and sharing us words of comfort, you hear those words of comfort. The pastor gives you the, to them. The, the pastor's wife gives them to you to comfort you and help you. But they also need that in return. Because I tell you what, one advice I give young people that say to me, I'm thinking about going to ministry. And I said, you better make sure it's a calling because they will eat you up and spit you out alive. And they will enjoy it while they chew on you. Trust me, I know. I've been there. But here's the thing the pastor needs to hear from you. Brother, it's going to be okay. I got your back. Don't give up. Hang in there. Because of God's comfort, we can have greater joy even during times of heartache. Even though Paul faced many problems, he still found joy and comfort in, in the progress of his ministry. Even during difficult times, we can still find joy in the Lord as we, if we look hard enough. Paul goes on, and there are times with a heartache that they're going to go through, and, 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 but there's going to be positive results. As a pastor, a lot of times I have to say things in a pulpit that are not really comforting. Paul knew about this. He wrote in chapter 7, verse 8, he says, Even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did not regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so that no harm to you in any, harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads us to salvation, leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. 
See what this godly, godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what in, in, indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this manner. What we are called to do as believers is follow Jesus Christ. Paul says, I know my letter I wrote you, the first letter I wrote you, brought you sorrow and, and, and hurt you. But you know what? I'm glad I did it because he brought you into a right relationship with God. That, that's, why I, <clears throat> that's why in my ministry, as I said earlier, what you hear is not nothing that I preach special. This is how I've always preached because I realize as I share God's word to you, as I share God's word to others, that I don't know your life. I don't know what you're going through, but God does. And so, so God is saying, I'm, giving, using, I'm using you as an instrument to help them to realize that what changes they need to make in their lives so they can have the joy that Paul had. They can have the joy complete in Jesus Christ by becoming more like Jesus. That's what it's all about. That's why we come to church is to grow, to be more like Jesus. Not to be like brother so-and-so or, or, or pastor so-and-so or, or, or that. We, we, we come to church to support each other, to help each other. One of these days we've talked about it. Janelle and I, and I mentioned last week about starting a church on Saturday nights. And we're going to call it the barn for Barnabas because Barnabas was the encourager. I want, I want this place to be a place of encouragement. Where people come and they can come as they are with all their sins and all their problems of the world. Be a place where they can be encouraged to become more like Jesus and to follow Jesus as the Lord and Savior. So often what happens in churches is, is we take sides and we, we let Satan use us to destroy all the good that God wants to do. How many of you like to be confronted with your sin? Or the mistakes you make? Now, there's some pastors out there that believe that they are above sin, that, that you never correct them. But as a pastor, what I have always done throughout my ministry, I will usually tell you what I have done before I've done it. Uh, we were on the keto diet for a little while. And, and, and yeah, I would joke and you know, talk about uh, it really helped my health tremendously. The cholesterol was a little high, but you know, everything else worked good. One of my weaknesses is donuts. Those good donuts with the cream filling with chocolate on the outside of them. And if you're on a keto diet, you know that's not allowed. But there were certain church members that I think were of Satan because they would always bring a chocolate donut with filling inside. <laughs> and I would go in their classroom and they'd say, Preacher! There's a chocolate donut over here for we saved just for you. And it was always, everybody, that's a preacher's, don't touch it. It was set aside from all the other donuts. And I, what I usually do in Sunday school is I make my rounds to visit all the classes and stick my head in. And, and so if they're going to yell at me, they're going to do it before church, not during church. And I'd get a donut and I would eat it and I'd always go by Janelle's class where she was at. And, and what, last Sunday we were at Fellowship, they, they, every class had a chocolate cream filled donut for me. <clears throat> One deacon said to me three times, we have donuts in our class. Yes, Jim, I heard you. They, they're good donuts. They're Houchins donuts. And I said, yes, Jim, I've heard you. And, and so, you know, and so I went in there and there it was by itself. And it had on the napkin, preacher's donut. And Janelle's classroom was from here to there, about the end of the wall. And so I, I ate that donut, and I got about half of it eaten. You can only cram so much and not get cream on your face at one time. And so about the time I got to the door, and I had my cup of coffee here, and, and I leaned in, and I had the donut here behind the wall. So nobody would know except for Jim's class that I had a donut. And, and Corey Watkins owns Watkins 316 Trucking. He says, you got a donut in that right hand behind that wall, don't you? And I said, yes, I do. <laughs> and they said, we won't tell Janelle. I always tell Janelle everything. I had a donut. Now we're trying to be vegetarians, which is going good. Until yesterday, I went to a man's conference, and they had barbecue. I ate it. That was a good deal. <laughs> what did you have for lunch? Barbecue. Was it good? No, it was terrible. <laughs> Paul was saying that sometimes we say things that hurt, but the thing of it is that that church, I had a relationship with the deacons, 
And I told him, I said, guys, I don't want you to critique me and I don't want you to beat me up because trust me, I don't care. But if there's something I say that offends you, let me know. And I always always say, well, well uh, they got to come to Jesus meeting. That so-and-so had a come to Jesus meeting. And one of, the, one of the men of the church says, you know, I just don't like that comment. And I said, yeah, you're right. That's not the right way to say that. He said, I'd much rather say they're going, they're going to get a butt whooping. So that's what I say. Now, y'all, they got a butt whooping. And so, uh, but the thing of it is, is we say it out of love to each other. And that's what Paul was doing. He was sharing the truth out of love, not to judge them, but to help them grow closer to Jesus. That's why you're here as a church, is to help each other to grow closer to Jesus. And sometimes we have to say things to each other. Now, I've had some people come to me and be very spiteful, very bitter, and very evil. There's been times on ministry I've had some retired pastors come up to me and tell me things and say things to me. And so very legalistic, so very wrong, and they'd say things just to be hateful to me. And then finally one day I kind of puffed up and I said, you know what, if you want my job, you can have it, but I don't think you'll get the vote. And he said, excuse me, son. I said, you can talk to me as an adult and as a fellow pastor, but don't you ever talk down to me out of anger and evilness I had another retired pastor in the same church he'd walk up to me and say brother Quint can we talk yes we can can you explain to this to me a little bit better and I say Bob thank you so much I never thought about that but let's talk about this never did it out of an evil heart never did it out of superiority this other pastor had a doctorate degree and he felt like he was above everybody and he treated me like I was trash. Mm, don't you do that. You can come to me in love, but don't you come down and, and be mean to me. See, that's the thing. Are you sharing God's love and his joy and helping each other out of joy and love? Or are you doing it just to be hateful? Paul finished up chapter 7. He mentions one thing that is vital for any church to stay in God's will. It's vital for any individual to stay in God's will. And that's devotion. Verse 12, so even though I wrote to you, I was not on account of the one who did the wrong or the injured party, but rather before God you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. What happens when individuals are devoted to something? What happens to when individuals are devoted to a family, a job, a hobby, or a team? They'll do whatever they can to make that, that successful. They do whatever it takes to be the best they can be at it. They have a hobby, uh, teams. You know, how many of you are St. Louis Cardinal fans? How many of you ever miss a game when you don't record it? Man, I tell you what, we live next door to my parents. I have to tell you what, it'd be a whole lot cheaper if Dad didn't want to watch every Cardinals game on my, on my cable bill. But he said, son, I don't care what you do at the, the television service, but if I don't get my Cardinals when they're playing, you're in trouble. <laughs> yes, sir. What would you do if the Cardinals were playing here in Cape Girada? Wouldn't you do all you could to get tickets for it? You'd be devoted. If you have a hobby that just consumes your life, you're devoted to it. What would happen is if we were devoted to Jesus and to making others more like Jesus and ourselves more like Jesus? Others are encouraged. Here's what takes place, verse 13. By all this, we are encouraged. In addition to our encouragement, we are especially delighted to see how happy Titus was because his spirit has been refreshed by all of you. Did you catch that? Paul says, I'm excited because of Titus and how you refreshed him. Every one of you. We'll be able to boast about what God is doing through the lives of others without fear of being embarrassed by what they do. Verse 14 through 16, Paul says, I boasted to him about you and, and, and you have your, that have not embarrassed you. But just as everything we said to you was true, so our boasting about you to Titus has proved to be true as well. Verse 15, and his affection for you is all the greater when he remembers that you were all obedient, receiving him with fear and trembling. And here's verse 16, Paul says, I am glad I can have, I have completed confidence, I have complete confidence in you. Paul says, I, I, I'm excited because 
as a church that was once troubled is now turned away and focused on God's will, not their will. And they're excited and have confidence. You don't want to see when God's working in your church? When people are getting saved. You want to know when God's working in your church? That you can look at somebody and see them grow spiritually and take steps of faith. I was talking with one of the gentlemen a while ago, and I said, you know, things that when you get a pastor and, and, and talk about churches growing, I said, this church will only stop growing is when you decide for it to stop growing. It will stop reaching the loss when you as a church decide to stop reaching the loss. When you become focused on yourselves and not encouraging and reaching others and make a difference in others' lives, that's when you'll start growing and stop growing because you're focused on you, not those outside of these walls. The greatest joy that you can have of any church, the greatest joy you can have as any Christian is see someone that you know come to know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. See someone come forward or someone at their home or at their work or, or wherever they're at say, Father, forgive me my sin. Come in my life and be my Lord and Savior. Someone who realizes they need Jesus. Do you need Jesus? Well, I don't know about you, but I do every day. You know why? Because I'm a total mess up. I can't believe my wife has stuck with me for 35 years. She's probably the best pastor's wife and the best wife any man can ask for. I'm being nice to her because she asked me why to go where I want to go eat after a while. <laughs> well, she did, but that's not why I'm being nice. The truth is, is there anyone in this room that's not a total messed up? How many of you are totally screwed up? Raise your hands. Hey, I, if I don't see every hand go up, we're going to be talking after church. Hey, hey, uncross those arms and raise your hand. Get it up. There you go. Sit back here and look holier than thou. I tell you what. Boy, I'm glad I'm only here another four or five weeks. <laughs> she got it out for me now, don't you? Pick me out of the congregation. I tell you what. I'll find out where you live. Next door to my parents in their garage. That's really easy to find. But folks, here's Paul had joy in those he wasn't even with because of what he heard they were doing. Do you want Paul's joy? You can have Paul's joy when you keep your whole attitude focused on Jesus and not on you. Do you know the times when I'm the most miserable? I'm 56 year old. I had two heart attacks at 32 in a church that I thought hated my guts. I had a stroke at 42. Well, my church was going through a $10 million lawsuit because someone fell in the gym during high school basketball practice. And every church I have ever pastored, I've had friends who claim to be my friends, but are the first ones that will lie, steal, and cheat for me and hurt me. I've had people talk bad about my wife. Oh, don't you dare do that. I'm a big old boy. But I tell you what's even worse. Don't you talk bad about me and let her hear about it. Because when the earrings come off, you're in trouble. <laughs> when you see her go, <laughs> mama's coming to town. Folks, as a church and as a body of believers, this should be a place of joy and encouragement. I enjoy your worship service. You know what I have more joy about in your worship service? They do a marvelous job. Don't you think so? Hey, give them a clap. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what joy I have? Is we're not a bunch of young people here. You give them the freedom to worship and praise God as they feel led to worship and praise God. Because you know what? You have probably one of the best worship teams and groups that I've ever seen in a small church. And if you're going to reach, yeah, you do. And if you're going to reach that 35 and 40-year-old and down group, you're going to need this. Okay? It's, see, that's it. It's not about the music you like. It's not about the music I like. It's about what God is doing to make an impact to reach the lost for Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning, and I thank you, and I praise you for all that you've done, all that you're going to do. 
Father, there's someone here today that's never received your saving grace. Today is a day of salvation. I pray that your spirit is so strong that you would lead them into not letting Satan keep them where they're at, but they receive your wonderful gift of grace today. Father, there's individuals who've been holding on to bitterness in the past. I pray that today is the day they, they let it all go. They let your joy begin to flow and that uh, you make a difference in their lives. Help us not, Father, to focus on the past, but help us to focus on the future. And Father, I pray that today you change lives to make us happy to be in your house. And to help us not to worry about others think, but just all we need to worry about is what you think and that we're doing your will in our lives. Father, I thank you for what you've done. I praise you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' precious name, amen. <clears throat>